guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 154, featuring part two of my interview with Janelle Jakeways. In this part of the interview, we talk about the, her time at Coleco, uh, the Coleco Vision, the Coleco Atom, and some prototypes uh, she worked on that never materialized. It's really good stuff. Uh, then we talk about Bard's Tale 4, uh, the Bard's Tale game that was never finished. Uh, we get to hear about what was going on behind the scenes and what Bard's Tale 4 would have been like. It's really, really good stuff. So without further ado, here is Miss Janelle Jakeways. Uh, let's uh, skip ahead a little bit, because um, I really want to get to this Coleco stuff. Okay. I know I have a, uh, uh, there's a lot of Matt Chat fans who are big, big fans of the uh, Calicos. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, really. Uh, so I just wanted to maybe start off just by how did you get involved uh, with Coleco? Okay. Well, there's actually a role-play gaming tie to it. Uh, fall of 1980, um, I was at a game convention in Michigan. Um, it's essentially one of my local conventions. And I was uh, meeting some people there for the first time. One of them was a game designer named Mike Stackpole. He's been associated back then with the Tunnels and Trolls game line and had designed some adventures and, and settings and was actually probably working on some rule revisions for them. Met him at that time. We became friends. And then about two weeks later, he called me up and said, hey, I've been hired as a contractor for Coleco. They're looking for one more person. Would you be interested? And I thought, well, um, so I talked about them, called the company, talked about what they were looking for, and they flew me out for an interview. And I sat and cooled my heels for most of a day waiting for the boss to have the time to interview me. Um, had a probably a half hour meeting with him. He liked me enough to hire me um, and then was surprised when I needed to go back and get things ready before I could come out and actually do work. So I started about a week later on the way back. Um, you know, I, I worked out a lot of my personal things with my family and the person I was dating at the time. And came back to Hartford and started working for Coleco as a contract game designer. And it wasn't on ColecoVision or even any of the later arcades. It was, um, we were creating a piece of game, a role-playing game to go on a piece of technology that used a sound generating chip or a speech generating chip, which was hot technology back in 1980, and a barcode reader which was hot technology back in 1980. Well, they found a way to do it cheaply. So we had a toy that would read the book content of a barcode that was fed on a card through a, a rolling reader and convert that into the speech phonemes. So we were figuring out games that used very short phrases that you could read off the card, a little bit of randomization. So we did... Um, we did a role-playing game, sort of, kind of. We did um, something very simple. I can't remember the name. It's basically it's a detective game where you guess, you get clues and you guess which detective it is. Now, I still actually have the artwork for that. So someday some game museum is going to get something from me. Um, and we worked on that for a few, a while, and the product didn't go anywhere. Mike stuck around for... Um, another couple months, and I stayed. I know the, the Coleco obviously had a lot of, uh, or Coleco had a lot of competition, you know, mm -hmm. with all these other systems and, and computers and everything. I've always been curious, what was the environment like? I mean, was there sort of this bitter rivalry, or was it just friendly, or, you know, how did it, how was it like from your point of view? The toy, well, the first thing to understand was that Coleco was first and foremost a toy company. So they had a professional rivalry and I guess understanding with other toy companies like Mattel, like um, Parker Brothers. Parker Brothers was still in business, like Milton Bradley and Ideal. Um, you know, there was, you know, they were competitors and always just trying to one up each other at Toy Fair every year. Well, the, they saw 
in 1982, 81, 82, the amount of money being spent on game cartridges and that their, one of their big competitors, Mattel, had jumped in. Um, so they looked at both this, they were looking at the systems and trying to figure, well, how can we, how can we make money for the company doing this? And especially they saw the Atari cartridges that were selling for what, 25 to $50 at the time. Well, they had four bit, they had 4k memory parts in them. Um, the ROMs the, even back then, those were relatively cheap. And they saw not, they saw it as printing, being able to print money with those. So they began a design campaign. I wasn't actually in my part of my group was in that. Unfortunately, at that time, um, I was working for Advanced Research and Development, and there had been some in, internal uh, political maneuvering, and the group I was in got gutted. Um, we lost basically almost all our engineers. We were down to a few designers. Um, and, but then all of a sudden, and they, they lost them inside the company to another director. So all of a sudden now there was this press to design um, these products. Well, the other department that had won the political battle was an engineering department. They did, they, they set things up for production. They didn't do design. They didn't know the first thing about what they really wanted in these products. So they came back to the research and development team. And um, between my boss and one of the other engineers still on the team, they worked to create the specs for a game that used the, the parts that are in the modern, you know, when I say the modern, the ColecoVision that actually shipped, which was the Z80 processor and the TI color chip. Those were the core of the graphics and processing. What they didn't realize at the time after we got into it is that the TI chip, or the TI, needed to store bit arrays for its graphics. Those don't go on a 4K memory part. <laughs> so all of a sudden they're all they're heavily invested in this product and they're discovering that it needs more mem much more memory than the Atari. So that's kind of what it was, is there was trying to get those. And eventually there was the pressure to get the cost of the parts down. That would be a perfect lead in for the, my question about the, uh, the atom. But, you know, before we, before we get into that, I, I mean, the, the system is known for these really good um, arcade ports, you know, the, the Donkey mm -hmm. Kong, uh, some, some, you know, Mega Race. Um, how, how did, what was it about the system that enabled that uh, degree of accuracy? Well, the thing was, it was it was those um, eight by eight um, memory or um, graphics blocks that we worked with. The Commodore um, computer also worked with those, so it was very similar. If anyone was familiar with programming chips or programming other than the Commodore, it was the same sort of thing. Is that we could create building blocks, either complex or simple, in eight by eight arrays. That we could build these screens and then we analyzed we didn't get the code we, nobody ever gave us code we had to analyze everything so both visually and for play we were studying these arcades and recreating them um, on a horizontal format most of those arcades if you remember they tended to place the video monitor vertically if you think about it there were a few that didn't but in most cases, the video monitor, as you played it, was placed vertically. So they were these tall format screens. We had to figure out how to do those screens on the horizontal ColecoVision and not do the cheap version where you cut it in and just use the center of the screen. So it was just analysis and having good tools to work with. When I say tools, um, bit parts, we didn't have graphics tools till near the end of the project. Does that answer the question? Sure. Uh, so about this uh, Adam. Okay. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, I know there's a lot of interest in, in collecting uh, uh, for the Adam, but mm -hmm. you know, even today, you know, I, I read the, you know, what the Adam was and what it was uh, the, the plan. For, I mean, it sounds like a really good idea. It know? was really ahead of its time. So, I mean, uh, what, what happened? I think there was. A number of, from what I, this is from what I understand from talking with some of the engineers 
after the fact, who are you know bitter about everything that happened. It was poorly engineered. Um, it was rushed through specs. They, they had a great idea from the software and what the product was. But when they got down to, let's particularly at the motherboard level, the circuit print, the circuit board level, the engineers tell me that's where things started falling apart. Is that it just, it was expensive to manufacture, they were poorly laid out, um, just poor design. And then you get things like the printer that would catch on fire. Um, you probably That's probably legend at this point. I think I've heard stories told of that, but we actually had a situation where um, one weekend people went away and they left a printer running in the clean room and it caught on fire. And I think they had to completely re-sanitize the clean room because of that. So, um, but say, there were things I liked about it. I really liked the keyboard. How does that sound? It had a really good feeling keyboard to it. And even though it was engineered to be cheap, um, the whole idea that it, you know, could run the, the, the whole um, idea that it could run ColecoVision cartridges, of course, made it accessible to everything that had gone before. Um, the digital data packs, it was a solution uh, to getting a lot of content available but at a cheaper price because disk drives, if you remember back, if you remember back in those days were $300 for, you know, a, if you owned a Mac or a, a Commodore, those disk drives were expensive. And also about the, about the size of the computer too, right? So yeah. <laughs> thinking about the 1541. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I was thinking, you know, with the Atom, even today I sometimes wonder, why doesn't uh, Microsoft release a keyboard, you know, and, a, and just make the 360 into a, a little computer, you know? Why is there so much resistance to that kind of idea? Because if you really think about it, it's cursed. If you really think about almost every personal computer that came out, or actually every game machine that ended up getting a keyboard attached to it, ended up eventually going down in flames in some way. Um, I'm trying to remember the history, but even the Intellivision, the Intellivision, somebody made a, I think they made a keyboard for it. That was pretty much the end of the Intellivision. Um, every system thereafter, I'm, I'm trying to remember my way through, but they, they have been fabulous disasters afterwards. And part of the problem is, is the, the game machines aren't, aren't, aren't really intended to be personal computers and personal computers at the time really weren't intended to be game machines. We kind of, that was kind of forced. Well, let's talk about uh, something that to me is a very tragic uh, topic. Mm -hmm. uh, this whole uh, Bard's Tale 4 oh. uh, project. I know a lot of, uh, you know, Matt Chat uh, viewers are <laughs> you know, like, I didn't even know there was going to be, you know, Bard's Tale 4. I, I looked it up on Wikipedia, and it's, it says unpublished. You know, it's very, a very mm -hmm. sad thing. So what I want to know is, why don't I have Bard's Tale 4 sitting back there on my shelf? <laughs> um, Bard's Tale 4 was not done by Interplay. That's the first thing. Interplay had um, parted company, or EA, I think, had parted company from Interplay at the time. I wasn't intimate with that. EA, um, Interplay had been one of my clients at one time. Um, but I got a call from a producer who was friends with Brian Fargo. And he worked, he was working on the Bards. Actually, what he was working on at the time was a horror role-playing game that probably was going to be, they were probably thinking it being something like Waste, Wasteland in that same sort of genre and setting. And they got a little bit further into it and I was, I was doing a lot of design spec writing for that. And then I was out there and they said, well, what we really need you to do is to jump over to this other project, Bard's Tale. And is this something you'd be willing to do? And well, of course, they were paying me really good money compared to what I was making as a role play game and designer and artist. So sure, no problem. I will extend my contract with you. So I started working on that and I was one of the... There had been several designers on the project ahead of me. Um, 
the guy who wrote Howard the Duck was ahead of me, head of line in that project. Wow. Um, you know, legendary father of role playing, Dave Arneson was ahead of me in line. And I think what I was brought in essentially to be was the script doctor to finish out what these other designers had done. And we got into it. We discovered there was really no linkage between the different things that everyone had done. And of course, when I started adding my own content that linked what I did to the front, it started getting a little more epic. And all at the same time, there were pro there was programming going on on from the database and tool side that just wasn't getting done. It was buggy. It wasn't make, making the product. And then on the art side, the artists working on it were very talented. They were producing some beautiful work. But what they were doing was because of the way the original design spec had been set up, there were three different points of view used in the game. There was that traditional down the hallway look. There was a what I'll call a shadow box view where you had animated characters seen full, full size in side view. And this was done for a lot of the role play encounters. And then there was a um, third person, um, an orthographic, that's what I'm looking for, the word orthographic view of, I don't think it was Scarabray. It might have been Scarabray, but it was a large city, the, 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 the King's Citadel. And you there were 3D renderings of buildings and people wandering around. And it was completely different. And it used a completely different set of characters and graphics than the other two versions. So they had this multiplicity of graphics styles, not styles, but, you know, point of view. You had a database that just wasn't working. Um, and you were already using technology um, in the terms of like, I called it, I think they called it the Westwood engine was to create those, those scrolling hallways. Well, this was already after Ultima Undermountain or Ultima Underground had come out with that complete, you know, radicalizing the way you looked at 3D underground. Um, and it just got to the point where it was starting to bleed money. And the producer on it finally made the right decision and killed it, or at least got permission to kill it. So you think it was the right decision? Yes, actually, for that product, yes, it was the right decision. I'm just wondering, what do you think ever happened to all this stuff? Is it sitting in a, a filing cabinet somewhere? I have, no, it was probably... From the EA side, it was probably destroyed. I do have books of some of the work, the design work that was done. Um, any of the disc stuff I had is long gone. Um, I've I've got like one or two printouts still surviving of the character art floating around. A lot, a lot of it has just died with age or um, loss in moves. And somewhere I've got the music, or at least samples of the music. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with part three of my interview with Janelle Jakeways. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank everyone who has supported and donated to the show. It really means a lot to me. It's keeping these episodes coming. Uh, so if you haven't donated or would like to, again, just go to armchairarcade.com. I'll look for the Match Hat link, and you're good to go. only takes a few seconds, and it means a lot to me. So thank you very much. Also, I need your ideas for future guests. I'm, I've got a list, but I really need your input on this. I want to know who you want to have on the show, especially if you have their contact information or know some way I can get in touch with them. That's actually really important. Uh, that's what takes, that's the hardest part for me actually is <laughs> finding these people. Uh, but if you do know somebody, maybe you can uh, introduce me or uh, at least give me their contact information. I'll happily contact them, send them an invitation, and hopefully have them on a future episode. So thank you very much guys, anyone who is willing and able to do that. Much appreciated. All right, what about that ale of the week? Now well, this week I have a Moylan's Dragoons Dry Irish Stout. Uh, this is brewed in Novato, California. 
got a bit of history to it. Apparently this was brewed to commemorate General Stephen Moylan, Irish-born commander of the 4th Continental Dragoons during the American Revolutionary War, but it is made with hops imported from the United Kingdom. So not quite sure how that's supposed to work out, but apparently it's won a lot of awards and is really good stuff. So let's get it open and see what it's all about. So I got some Moylan's Dry Irish Stout here in the old rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this and trying to decide what does, what does that smell like. It's kind of a kind of a fruity you know, sort of blueberries and licorice kind of thing. I don't know where that's coming from, but it's a very you know very pleasant smell. It's uh, quite nice. You know, so let's give it a taste. Hmm. Well, it's kind of a uh, you definitely. Can definitely taste a lot of that sort of fruity taste. You know, if you eat a bunch of blueberries and that sort of aftertaste, and that's sort of what you get here. Kind of a, you know, it's, it looks like a Guinness, and you would think it would taste like that, but it's actually a lot lighter. Um, there's not nearly as much uh, foam or head on this, uh, for one thing. It's actually quite drinkable. I can see why it won those awards. And it's good stuff. You know, I think. Uh, you know, it's not too strong either, so if, you're, if you don't like a strong alcohol, a strong ale, uh, this would be a very good choice. Very tasty, and not nearly as thick and chocolatey as a Guinness. Uh, so even if you uh, don't like Guinness, you know, you might want to give this, this one a shot. All right, so it's time for the quotation. This one comes from one of my favorite comedians, Mr. George Burns, and it goes something like this. I would rather fail at doing something I love than be a success. It's something I hate. See you guys next week. I'm booting these games and I'm going right in and I'm killing rats, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, I have been asked to go kill rats now for 20 straight years, okay? <laughs> and it just seems so insane at this point that people had not, you sort of, you know, changed it up a bit, right?